Um, Vera Kennedy is a sociology instructor from West Hills College, Lemoore, um, she and a lecturer at California State University, Fresno. She um, received her BA in sociology in 1995, an MPA in political science with an emphasis in public administration in 1999 from Fresno State, and an EdD in education with an emphasis in curriculum and instruction from Argosy University in 2012. Um, she currently serves on the Merlot Sociology Editorial Board and was an e-textbook reviewer in 2015 for the California OER Council, which is cool for Ed. So thank you very much for being with us, Vera, and you will get to hear more from her in just a moment. Regina Gong is a librarian at Lansing Community College, where she is responsible for collections, both print and electronic, and the library systems. Regina leads the OER initiative at LCC as the OER project manager. She's done numerous presentations on OER, both within Michigan and well as, as well as nationally. This is Regina's second time doing a webinar for CCC OER, and it's her second time presenting with Amy Hofer, who is a coordinator for the statewide open education library services for the Oregon Community Colleges and the genius behind Open Oregon. So um, I'd like to welcome all three of our panelists today. Um, and again, my name is Quill West. I am the president of CCC OER and a um, open education project manager at Pierce College in Washington. But my job here today is just to kind of introduce people and lead things. Um, <clears throat> so the Community College Consortium for Open Education Resources for folks who are un unaware of our project um, is a community of practice dedicated to promoting the adoption and development of open education resources to enhance teaching and learning. Um, we were founded mostly to support community college missions of open access by lowering costs through open education resources. Um, we create awareness and development of openly licensed materials. We reach out to our community to work together for those purposes. Um, and then we do regularly scheduled online and face-to-face -face workshops. Mostly we do webinars much like this one. Um, and we try to showcase special projects where people are engaged in open education and um, adoption of open education. So um, if you are not familiar with our work, please see our website, which is cccoer.org. Um, it has many useful things, including um, guides for how to build your own open education projects. Um, CCC OER is a membership organization, and we're at to over 250 colleges in 21 states and provinces. And you can see by this map that we have a really strong um, membership in both the East and the West, and we would love to invite anybody from the middle of the country who is interested in open education resources to join us because we'd like to get more of those red dots in the middle. Um, okay, so I am actually going to turn this over to Vera Kennedy at this point. She's going to talk to us about um, adoption efforts at her own institution and her own work in open education. Vera, you should have control over the um, over the slides now. Okay, thank you, Quill. And right now I'm not getting anything. Let me see. So I'll go ahead and click forward and try to fix it, then you can get started. <laughs> I'm gonna click forward just to make sure it's working on my end and actually I'm not getting anything, so. Okay. <coughs> do you wanna just do it for me and I'll cue you? <coughs> Um, sure. Yeah, until I can get it fixed. Awesome. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. I do want to thank you for attending. And before I begin, on behalf of the panel, we want to thank Quill West and Una Daly for organizing this session and inviting us to participate. We are very excited to be here. I also want to thank my West Hills College family for their support and encouragement in planting and cultivating OER on our campus. So today I'm going to share both my personal journey and our institutional efforts in growing OER. Okay, Quill? So my story began actually in 2012 um, when a colleague in biology sent me an email with some information about some open source uh, textbooks being published by OpenStax. And before this point, I really wasn't even aware 
what open sources were, to be honest with you. Um, and I took some time and reviewed the materials that he sent me. And they looked of quality and had some great content in them, but still being hesitant on really what it was and how I might use it in the classroom, I shared it with our part-time faculty who also did a review. And we spent about a couple months looking at the textbook itself, going back and forth with how it might be used, um, how it would supplement um, some of the exercises and assignments we had already designed in our courses. You have seen other published works. And it took us a few months, and in 2013, we decided to go ahead and adopt the textbook while still keeping some of our other copy uh, written materials. So at that point, we were still really running what I would call some hybrid courses as far as using open sources and copy written sources. And it took us a while to kind of figure out um, how to use the book, because like most faculty, we were used to getting published works that had a series of exercises, assignments, test banks. And when we first uh, were introduced to OpenStax, we had the very first original edition, which only had a couple of questions at the end of each chapter and a test bank. It didn't have any exercises, any lecture notes, how you might incorporate this. So I would say for the last four years, we've all been playing with it, developing it, um, the OER community has expanded, so there are a lot more resources out there available that we could adopt and integrate into our courses. So I would say it took us about four years, and in this year, I can honestly say that for an introductory sociology course, we have a complete free and open course, meaning free of any copyright material and open, meaning no cost to the student. So for the last four years, the students uh, went from this transition of buying some supplemental books and materials to now what we call the complete no cost um, aspect of the course. And I've published a couple of my courses if you want to see them in Canvas. We have the course shell, which is the Achieving the Dream course shell. Very basic. It's a skeleton to kind of get faculty started without invading their academic freedom, giving them the ability to figure out how they want to adopt and use it. So it really just has the textbook, uh, basic things that are available in regards to textbook as far as assignments, assessments we're doing. But a complete course shell, which is a fully developed course that I'm using um, in my classes, is also available. And I titled that the Social One OER because it does have like content specific to my teaching style. But I wanted to make those both available to you if you want to go check those out. And so where I'm headed next um, personally is I'm looking at making sure that my materials are published in other areas that make them available on the web. Um, other than in Canvas, because not all users are in Canvas. And then I'm expanding to my other social courses to complete a degree. So I do want to share with you some of the tools and resources that I used and, and I learned how to use as I was kind of going through this process. Quill, if you can hit the slide, please. Thank you. So one of the first things I had some difficulty was was finding resources to supplement my course. And so what happened is I realized I was doing searches incorrectly. Um, I was really looking at the discipline and searching the topic of sociology and then the major topics within sociology, not focusing on the objective or the concept. So using OER really helped me and other faculty, part-time faculty in my area, think about concept learning, project-based learning, and finding materials that would then support student learning outcomes. What is it that we were actually trying to do in the classroom rather than trying to get through an entire textbook? And of course, a lot of us heard about LibGuides and, and they're fantastic as a starting point, but they were specific things I needed for my course and I had to learn how to narrow down my searches and make sure I was using the right search tools. And one of them was learning how to use Google appropriately, setting the filters in the settings section for the advanced search. So I was getting materials that were open. And then I also um, installed the Creative Commons search tool on my web browser, um, which I have found fabulous, especially for photos. Um, it will filter for me and find photos. Now realize it's not a science. You still have to go and check the copyright, the attributions, making sure that you really have open sources. So both of these search tools, as well as LibGuides, sometimes they pull up things, but other additional resources or supplementals in them are not open. So I just want to remind you to look for that. Uh, the Creative Commons is also doing a beta test on a new search tool. So I haven't had a chance to use it, but I'm looking forward to it because I've had a good experience with the original one. 
And then for me, I really was able to access Merlot. Not all sources on Merlot um, are open, but they are peer reviewed. And I'll talk to you a little bit how I got involved with that. But in Merlot, what it helped me do is identify resources that are out there and give me ideas. So even if I couldn't find something exactly like I wanted, even if I found something that was copywritten or published uh, by a private entity, I could then kind of retool it and think about what is something I could create that will uh, be a complement to the course and what I wanted to teach as far as learning outcomes. So that ended up being a good tool for me. Um, the best thing that I learned is that I had already had a lot of stuff. I had been teaching for a while, and even though I was using published material, I had like redesigned and, and came up with some assignments on my own over the course of time. And I never really thought about, hey, you already have half the work done. <laughs> you just need to integrate it and take out all the copywritten stuff and, you know, reframe some things, uh, come up with new fresh ideas based on what I already had. Um, so that also helped me in realizing that my inventory could be an asset. And I've tried to share that with other faculty. I have a history. Uh, professor here at the college, and she really doesn't like some of the open textbooks that are out there, but has detailed lecture notes. And so I told her, why don't you use your lecture notes as the basis and use the textbook to kind of augment and supplement what you have. So that kind of gave her a different perspective and idea of how this might work. Uh, Quill, if you'll hit the next one for me, please. Um, here are some materials, and I want to include the links just so that you know where to find them. If these are some of the best tools that I found. So I had a couple of uh, handouts and materials that helped me evaluate just in general whether a source was good. And I like these because they were quick checkbox. And so uh, the Community College Consortium has a checklist as well as BC Open Campus. And I like to use those because it gave me like a quick thing. Should I even waste my time digging deep into these resources? So help me evaluate it right away. And then when I found something that might be useful, I used a couple of tools, um, the Community College Consortium, they have an open textbook adoption worksheet. So it's actually a rubric, but I'm biased. I have to be honest. My favorite tool was the one developed by the California OER Council only because I was invited to be a faculty reviewer of some of the first open social one textbooks. And so I got trained in this model. So of course I feel the most comfortable with it, um, but it's very detailed. It went into things that I had never thought about open sources, like the accessibility, the usability, not just content. I was really focused on content and would forget some of those other, other important technical aspects of an open source resource. Um, and then, so the other thing I wanna mention is the Cool for Ed, where they have course and faculty showcases. I know that we've been building that in California which is great because we have faculty from a diverse community, uh, including community colleges, the state universities, as well as the UCs. And they all will look at different resources and kind of provide a showcase of what they think about it, um, but don't necessarily recommend which one you should use. You just kind of get our feedback about them. So that's very helpful. Thank you, Quill, if you'll hit the next one. And so the three main things I learned was make sure that you're modifying your sources to fit. And I put some authoring um, resources there that you could use. The second was the biggest mistake I made of all over the last four years, which was I was finding materials and I was putting them in folders and kind of citing them in a way where I could find them, but not citing them in a way that made a clear attribution for that when I shared these materials back out. So I always recommend now that you right away when you find something, you're gonna integrate it and embed it, that you make the attribution right then and there. You put the link, <laughs> you make sure the link is live and everything is working. We use the Open Washington tool and you can ask your IT administrators to embed this in your learning management system. That's what we did. So we don't have to leave Canvas in order to access this tool. It just pops up for us and you complete. It's really simple. It asks you the questions, you just fill it in. And then the third thing, the most important thing is don't expect to adopt something and it be done. Like adopt something and let it be the skeleton. You're going to put bone, you got the bones and you're going to put meat on this. You're going to put flesh on this. You're going to build it that best fits your students. And the best way to do that is make sure you get feedback. Uh, the four years that we did this, all the social instructors were doing a course reflection. It was an open-ended reflection where we would get feedback from students and we would modify based on the feedback we received. 
And then we actually formalized this last year for those courses that had fully adopted and became fully open sources, which right now are just two on our campus, which is Intro to Psychology and Intro to Sociology. And we did publish a paper, so you can see our findings. I included that link, as well as I include the survey, which is a lot more broader now. We have questions that we ask the students about accessibility, usability. So it's kind of a continual improvement process. You need to analyze your data, modify, and then start all over, uh, build your course, modify things, and then do it again. Quill, well, thank you. The last couple of things I want to mention is our institutional journey. Um, it took us a while before we actually had a college policy and it went back and forth between the faculty and the administration as far as the roles, um, the freedom, those kinds of things. So we do have our policies, but they weren't approved by our board until 2016. We do have OER in our strategic plan, which is really good because that, that supports faculty in the development of it, including professional development and training. Um, we right now are in the process of formalizing our OER committee. Before now, we were kind of like a task force or an ad hoc committee. And so Academic Senate is formalizing us as a subcommittee under their arches. We will have 16 members and administrative and faculty co-chairs. And then it, the membership includes the a curriculum committee rep, learning area reps. It also has room for student representative and part-time faculty, which we're really excited about because they've been involved a lot in this process. Quill? Another thing that often we get questions about is our stipend structure. Um, what are some of the carrots or motivating factors to help faculty uh, start doing research and developing OER courses? And I have to be honest, um, before this last year, our funding was based off some soft monies that we had received. We had um, were awarded the California Innovation Award for higher ed, and it was for our REG 365 program. It had nothing to do with OER, but the funding was flexible. And so our district decided that they would fund different faculty proposals in different areas. And at the time, we were really looking at developing tablet courses. So a few of us faculty members submitted proposals and in developing tablet courses, we included the OER language. So this allowed us to get paid for our research and development of our courses. And we were paid on an hourly basis as temp employees. Once we be, begin receiving official OER grants and awards, and right now we have a few, we have one from the Achieving the Dream and two from the California Chancellor's Office. Once we receive this funding, we were able to structure the stipend criteria a little bit better. And faculty had a voice in how this was developed. So right now, if you're just doing professional development, like doing research and trying to find a text to adopt, you can get a thousand dollar stipend for doing that work. And then the course development and redesign, it all depends on what degree you're working under, your course fits under, or if you have a non-degree that you're working under, but you're interested in OER. So the structure is kind of the same. If you develop a course map, if you just map it out, which is really the skeleton, it's a $2,500 stipend. If you develop a complete course shell, it's $3,500. And then if you have our connected learning evaluate your course um, using the online education initiative um, rubric and it passes, you get an additional $1,000. And then we also have course mentors. So people have already developed courses or been working on OER on our campus. Um, they get a stipend for esteemed others and you get $250 if you help map and then another $250 if that course meets the OEI uh, exemplary rubric. And if you have co-designers, they basically split the stipends. All right, Quill. So this is my contact information. If you have any questions or you'd like some additional resources, please feel free to contact me. I would be happy to share anything that we have available. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes if anybody has a question that you want to post, or if as an attendee you put your hand in the air, there's a little icon that looks sort of like a hand. Um, I would be happy to take questions and we can unmute your mic for that. Let's see here.
So um, Vera, we have a question that is, what is the charge of the OER committee from Kate? Uh, we help with the strategic planning. So kind of mapping out um, the direction that the college wants to go, um, establishing some benchmarks. A lot of it also is providing technical assistance and support for faculty. So we work hard in identifying our training and professional development needs. And we also host um, some innovate, what we call innovate training um, over the summer and then participate in ongoing activities throughout the academic year. We have other professional development, I would say um, structures like a teacher trade and talk and we participate in those. So really just helping with planning, uh, being the inter intermediary contact and in dealing with administration staffing needs, helping with the grants, and then ensuring that we're fulfilling our planning efforts and reporting efforts as we go and um, fulfill some of these OER initiatives. Okay, and one more question. Um, I Antonio would like to know more about the stipends for OER development. Is this specific to your campus or statewide in California? No, this is specific to our campus. Um, I heard a really great stipend structure we were all kind of jealous about. I know Richard Sebastian, who is the director of the Achieving the Dream OER initiative, he's talked about when they received a grant um, in their college, the faculty shared the entire grant. So they divided it up equally, which just sounds really exciting. <laughs> we wish we could have done that. However, we would then not be able to provide more stipends for all faculty. We want to give faculty all of them to have an opportunity. We just didn't want the leaders on our campus. Um, but I know that's how what they did when they first started. That's not what they're doing now. Um, but yeah, so I think every campus, I mean, you have to follow the grant guidelines. Um, and your business office guidelines, that is the most difficult struggle, is trying to figure out how to pay people. Um, and then once you do that, you can establish, once you know what the boundaries and parameters are, you can establish what is fair. And we kind of went off of what it would cost to have release time or overload. So if you were teaching an extra class, what would you get paid? And that's the structure that we used as faculty. That is a very good question and paying people can be rather fraught. So I'm hopeful that our next panelist will be able to tell us a little bit more about what happens at her institution. Um, Regina, please go ahead and introduce yourself and I'm going to try to turn the keyboard over to you now. Yeah, so thank you Quill and thank you Vera for that um, sharing of your story there in California. My name is Regina Gong. And I am a librarian at Lansing Community College. So what, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is um, just highlights of what we have been doing here at LCC in terms of our OER project. But I also like to highlight um, the other many, many great things that happening across um, other community colleges here in Michigan as well. So let me see if I can advance. I can't. Okay, yeah. So that is my contact information. If you want to send me an email or if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my um, Twitter handle. Okay, so Lansing Community College, we are located here in downtown Michigan. And we were founded in 1957. So this year is actually our 60th year anniversary. And we're the, thir the third largest community college in Michigan in terms of um, enrollment. So um, our OER project is actually one of the key initiatives of our um, strategic plan. And because it is an integral part of our strategic plan, um, we really have a very good institutional support. And I don't know why it's advancing on its own. <laughs> but, okay. Okay, so we actually started our OER project in fall 2015 semester. And we've gone a long way since that um, pilot project um, in fall. So back then we had five courses with 11 sections using OER 
And we had five faculty adopters and 317 students enrolled in those courses. So now in our current spring semester, we now have 16 courses using OER and that represents 100 sections. We have 47 faculty adopters and 2,462 students enrolled in, the, in those courses. So in terms of um, savings, so we have saved over 600,000 since fall 2015. So that is from fall 2015 to spring. 2017 semester. And that figure um, is calculated based on a um, $100 um, multiplier. So our students really, really um, love these courses that offer OER. And most of the feedback that we get from them really concerns, you know, savings and how these savings um, really affected them. And so I'll give you a chance to kind of read it. I have, I have more feedback from our students and most of it, they say that it's life changing for them, not having to worry about purchasing, um, you know, expensive textbooks. I really don't know why it's doing this. <laughs> anyway, okay. I'm sorry, it's kind of like jumping from one I'm trying to stop it. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not doing anything. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight that our first foray into OER is in the adoption. And I'm sure most of you are in that too. Um, you know, you started OER with just replacing your um, publisher textbook with an openly licensed textbook. And you know, some of our faculty are um, you know, content with just doing that. But also, but you know, we have also faculty who are creating OER themselves. And I just like to highlight some of the faculty um, who are doing that. Oh, I don't know why this is jumping. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so one of our faculty um, who has created an OER, actually two, um, is Dr. Mark Kellen. He's our psych faculty. Um, he created two um, OER textbooks. The first one was personality theory, which he uses for his um, uh, personality theory class. That one, um, he had this book for a long time, and he's been using that for his class. But when I started with our OER project, I was able to uh, persuade him to openly license that particular textbook. And um, the last one that he did was um, through the sabbatical. That's the Tao of Positive Psychology. He had a sabbatical in fall 2016, and he wrote this textbook. And I have the link here. Um, I can paste the link. Um, somewhere else in the chat if you want to take a look at that. Um, the positive psychology textbook is still not done, but um, he is he, he already um, deposited it in OER comments. And he is um, continually revising that um, textbook, which is what really is good about an OER. Um, and then we have another faculty who has created another OER um, textbook. Um, Dr. Matthew Van Cleve, um, he created the Intro to Logic and Critical Thinking, which um, he's using for his um, Phil 151 class. Um, he did this over like, you know, he, he had the material with, with him over the years and he just got into packaging it and putting a license to it in um, 2015. So he is, this is being used in um, five sections that offer this class. Um, Quill, if you can just advance it yourself. Okay, so, so for us here at LCC, we didn't stop with just OER. We are also um, into open educational practices. Um, let's see. Okay, so 
one of our faculty, Jim Luke, who is um, our economics faculty, started the Open Learning Lab. Um, the Open Learning Lab actually allowed, um, you know, faculty to create uh, learning experiences that helps our faculty, our students, and the LCC community as well. Um, we are a domain of one's own institution, and I believe we are the first community college, college who is um, a domain of one's own um, institution. So basically, that one um, allows our faculty and students to um, have their own digital um, footprint, you know, engage in um, digital literacy practices and have their own um, domains or websites where they can put in the work that they have done out in the open. And a lot of our faculty, too, are um, engaging in what um, Dr. David Wiley um, refers to as renewable assignments. Those assignments that um, bring many meaning to the students, not those assignments which, you know, are disposable and after they're graded, they are discarded. So, Okay, and LCC also is an institutional member of CCCOER. We just um, become an institutional member in fall 2016, and we are really reaping the benefits of being an institutional member because we now have this um, support that we get from CCCOER and the greater OEC um, community. Um, we are also an OpenStax institutional partner. We are working with um, these institutions to advance our um, OER projects here. So um, we work towards a shared um, strategic goal, um, our strategic plan um, that we um, have each of the colleges accountable, and we also help each other so that um, we can advance. Our, our OER initiative in our campuses. And of course, I'd like to highlight the things that are happening here in Michigan, um, the state. So it is really with Michigan Colleges Online that we are um, working to together, all 28 community colleges, um, because of the MCO OER initiative that we have. And MCO, incidentally, is an associate member of CCCOER as well. So a shout out to Rhonda Edwards, who is the executive director of Michigan um, Colleges Online. And I see a lot of my colleagues here at um, Michigan are also attending. So shout out with you, shout out to you all. Um, in fall 2015, we, um, Rhonda, convened a group of stakeholders um, that represents all members of the 28 community colleges in Michigan. Um, the goal of this MCO OER initiative is actually to improve student success, lower cost um, of um, textbook for our students, and also increase interinstitutional collaboration. So, Bronda actually monitors the savings realized by um, all community, all Michigan community colleges who are um, doing their own um, OER initiative. So, Quill, can you advance for me, please? Thank you. So, um, Rhonda sends out the survey every semester so that each of the representatives from community colleges can report um, open textbook usage. And we started doing this in the fall. So if you can just go to the next slide. So um, Rhonda actually, okay, did this last fall, 2016, and based on the data that um, she has gathered, there's, out of the 28 community colleges in Michigan, there's 14 of us who have um, an OER initiative in our campuses. So together, we have 120 courses using OER, and we have saved um, $1.5 million. In spring 2017, um, still 14 colleges are reported, and we have a total combined savings of $1.2 million. 
And what we also did as a group was, I don't know why the picture is not displaying, but anyway, um, we also worked in that project to create uh, an OER Commons hub through uh, OER Commons. So each of the community colleges are represented as a group in that hub. And that hub um, curates and makes available all um, the OER that are created in our, in our institutions. So, okay. There you go. That's that's the picture of all um, the 28. I mean, just part of the 28 community colleges in Michigan. Um, so you have LCC and all other um, community colleges represented here as a group at um, the MCO OER Commons Hub. And aside from that, MCO also um, has faculty grants that allow our faculty to engage in adoption, adaptation, and creation of OER. And as you can see here, um, these are the colleges that got grants uh, from MCO for adoption. And then these are the colleges that um, got a grant for adoption and for the creation. And all the work that um, this faculty will um, be doing will be made available in our MCO OER Commons Hub. So um, aside from, from the, the, the other good things that I've already mentioned, um, our colleague at Bay College, they are part of the ATD OER Initiative um, project and they are working towards the degree for a liberal arts, bachelor of uh, business administration, mechatronics, and robotics. And um, they hope to have that available and offered by fall of 2018. Um, as for LCC, we didn't get a grant from um, ATD, but uh, we are planning to also offer a Z degree for um, our AA in psychology and transfer studies, um, hopefully by fall of 2018. And then, of course, um, we are also a Go Open State. So Michigan is one of the 19 um, Go Open States um, that, that are already participating in this um, national initiative sponsored by the Department of Education. And um, it's actually an initiative that is being um, headed by our Michigan Department of um, Education. So they convened a stakeholders group, which um, consists of not just community colleges, but universities and the Library of Michigan, and of course, K to 12 um, teachers, so that we can um, craft a statewide OER strategy for Michigan. The, the goal is to have um, a repository, much like what we have um, with MCO, so that we can house and vet all those um, teacher curated resources, especially from the K-12 sector. And then lastly, this is just my um, way of um, telling you that um, in order to sustain you know, our OER efforts in our institutions, I think we need this three C. So conversation, connection, and collaboration. Um, I mean, I, conversation is very important because um, that's, that's the starting point, right? We need to be able to um, talk together, talk, talk with each other, and also to listen to each other so that you know, we would be able to um, advance our OER um, initiatives. And within those conversations would come connections, right? So connections um, is a result of the conversations that we have, whether face-to-face -face or, or online. And those connections will also allow us to build relationships that would help us take our open education in this initiative forward. And then with those connections come collaboration, right? So we are able to find opportunities where we can work together. 
and then the cycle goes back again and it's never ending but i think this is this is the key we have to keep the conversation going so that we will have those connections and find opportunities where we can collaborate not just within our own institution but outside as well so that's it if you have any questions just please put that in the chat box so regina we do have one question um yeah. and and we we only have really time for one right now but um so first i want to tell everybody in the in the room just to make it clear we are recording this session um and we'll um be sharing it as soon as we can get it uploaded um in the meantime um in terms of questions Alexis would like to know more about the open learning lab. Is that a physical space or a workshop series or something else? Um, it's not really a physical physical space. It's more it's more like an online space, and it's um, open learning. It's openlcc.net. So, but Jim, who started that. Um, basically has has that um house i mean it's not really a space but it's part of our center for teaching excellence so um they do all these workshops that um, teaches faculty how to um, go beyond just oer basically how to do um, how to engage in open pedagogy and other open education practices so yes, it can be a lab, uh, a physical lab, but um, as of now, it's not yet. It's, it's just part of our um, Center for Teaching Excellence, but it is a website and it's um, openlcc.net. So you can go there and take a look. Thank you very much, Regina. So um, if more questions come up, I'll be sure that we'll ask them later, but I want to give Amy full time to share her presentation with us. So I'd like to introduce Amy Hofer from Open Oregon. Um, and Amy, I'm not going to try the slide thing because it seemed to have messed it up. So you just let me know when you're ready for me to advance. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I am going to talk about the statewide program perspective. So let's look at the next slide. Um, so my uh, funding comes, it's statewide money, but there has to be a fiscal agent for the money. Um, and that's Lynn Benton Community College, which is where I report to. And um, so Vera mentioned earlier how hard it is to pay people. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that because my background is as a reference librarian and I've been on a very steep learning curve with that. Um, so faculty always say that what we can do to increase um, use of OER is support, financial support. Um, and so how to actually make that happen because Lynn Benton Community College can't create a financial relationship with every faculty member in the state who receives a stipend or a grant. Um, so we rely on the relationships between the colleges um, in order to get people paid through their existing payroll. Um, and what I've started to do in order to um, sort of make the gears turn more smoothly is that um, when people are applying for OER funding, um, they need to say what the additional payroll costs for the employer will be in order to pay them that amount of OER award. Um, and of course, faculty have no idea what that means. I had no idea what that meant um, until very recently. Um, so I have a link that um, goes to a spreadsheet with all of the contact information of the different business offices um, of the colleges. And um, that means you have to get in touch with your business office at the point that you're applying for a grant. 
Um, I've had situations where faculty get to the point where they need to invoice Lynn Benton in order to get paid and their business office didn't even know that they had a grant. And that kind of surprise is not pleasant for anybody. So um, just getting those conversations going at the point of application and then we can do an MOU between the faculty member and their college and Lynn Benton, which is the fiscal agent. Um, and then when it comes time to invoice and pay somebody, we have already worked out um, exactly how we want that to work. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna move on from that topic, um, but I, I just wanted to echo what Vera said earlier that it is hard to pay people. There were a lot of um, unexpected, for me, um, sort of unexpected bumps in the road. And the thing that was really worthwhile was to just get business office folks on the phone and to tell them, I'm on a really steep learning curve. Can you help me understand how this works? Because it felt like we weren't even speaking the same language at the beginning. And I think now we've sort of learned how to um, talk to each other a little bit better. Okay, so um, I, um, I'm gonna focus on things that are, um, happening in Oregon that are, oh, if we could go on to the next slide, Quill, that'd be great, thank you. Um, things that are increasing um, open ed um, OER adoption in Oregon that I've sort of been introducing within about the last six months. So um, we have an, um, a grant program that was modeled on the Georgia Affordable Learning Grant Program um, that we've been working on for almost two years now. Um, and initially we had about um, eight or nine grants, um, $500 adopt grants in that first category. Um, and the biggest category initially was revise and remix, which was telling me that our community college faculty are passionate about affordability. And that might be what initially draws them to use OER, but that they're also really excited about the ability to customize their materials and take advantage of the affordances of the open license. Um, but then um, in the fall, there was like a, a cushion of money in the budget that I'm part of that needed to be spent before the end of the biennium. And um, it was decided that we want to use this for more faculty OER grants, um, which was a really great demonstration of support. So it was about 50000 additional dollars but it had to be spent before the end of the biennium. And because of that fast turnaround, um, I realized this needs to only be adopt grants at $500 per person. Like there is no time for a more in-depth project. You need to just find something that already exists and implement it in your course in either winter or spring of 2017. Um, and while I came to this sort of by necessity because of the time constraint, um, I am really liking the model and I hope to use it again in the next biennium. Um, so in fall, we said, you know, hey, put in a proposal for either winter or spring. And then in winter, there was a little bit of money left in the budget and we said, hey, put in a proposal for spring quarter. Um, and what's been really nice is that it gives people, this rolling grant application gives people a way to um, participate throughout the biennium rather than being told, oh no, you have to wait another year to be able to apply for funding. Um, and then from the program perspective, um, when you give someone a $500 grant and then in about a month's time, you can ask them what their enrollment was that next quarter. So it's a really quick turnaround in terms of being able to show the impact of spending that money. Um, and I just wanna really briefly say something else that Vera mentioned. Um, that really resonated with me was the need for the ancillary content that's usually provided by publishers. And I'm thinking that I'd like to add another category um, to the next round of grants, which would be create and share ancillary materials for existing OER, right? Like we know that that's a hurdle for faculty adoption. So let's just try to um, overcome that um, by putting some money into it. Okay, Quill, let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, so something else that I've been doing um, starting in winter and continuing this spring and hopefully in an ongoing way is an OER course redesign training. And I put a link um, into the Canvas course um, on the slide. You're welcome to visit, you're welcome to um, borrow and reuse. It's a CC BY course. It's four weeks long, asynchronous, 
online, totally self-paced. Um, faculty always want to know how long it'll take them <laughs> to redesign their course. And um, there's really so many variables that it's not possible to estimate. So I just tell them, please set aside 10 to 12 hours during the four weeks. And I have no idea how accurate that really is because it depends on so many different things. Um, the outcome of the training is exactly the same as the outcome of an ADOPT grant. It's a $500 stipend for completing the training and redesigning your course. And the only deliverable in the training, like the only requirement is that you have redesigned your course using OER. Um, but that said, what's different is that you're in this Canvas course, um, there's sort of a lot more context, a lot more explanation. There's a very obvious direct way to get in touch with me through the discussion board. There's been some interesting conversation between participants. Um, so it's, it's a sort of, it's for people that want to have um, sort of more interaction and more support around that OER adoption. And if you do go into the course and check it out, um, it's, I mean, the idea for the course is really influenced by a conversation that I had with Quill at Open Ed last year. Um, you'll see that a lot of the content um, is borrowed um, from Bo Young Che's wonderful course on Open Washington. Um, but you'll also see that I have a really sort of particular take on course redesign. I'm very influenced by Wiggins and McTeague's concept of backwards design. So um, the course starts by talking about, you know, do you have outcomes? Do you have assessments that let students demonstrate that they have achieved those outcomes. Okay, now let's talk about what content your students might need in order to succeed in those assessments. So um, in a way, um, since content isn't necessarily like the biggest thing about redesigning a course, the idea of using open content is also, you know, uh, not minimized, but it's uh, sort of a little bit smaller than in some other course redesign trainings that I've seen. So if you're looking for something with um, like a bigger emphasis on open, you might look at the um, Tidewater online training for faculty, um, which is also wonderful and just has a little bit of a different emphasis. Um, and Quill, if you could advance the slide. I also just really briefly wanted to mention one more thing that um, that is happening in Oregon. We have a research group that um, is so indebted to the great work of the Open Ed Group. Um, I put a link to their fabulous toolkit and John Hilton has been really generous um, with providing support for what we're doing here in Oregon. Um, and um, John also um, said, he, he used an Isaac Newton quote um, about research. Um, it's all that is needed to achieve greatness is a plan and not quite enough time to do it. And that, really accurately captures what we're doing with the Oregon OER research group. But um, I wanted to just mention it in this talk about increasing OER use um, in Oregon, because the audience of the research is, of course, you know, the broader open ed community, but it's also a very, very local audience in some cases, like, um, you know, when folks are doing scholarship of teaching and learning research, to show that students are not harmed by the use of an open textbook instead of the publisher textbook. Um, the reason is that they sit in department meetings right next to a colleague who says, but how do you know that this book is any good, right? So in a way, the audience is super local. And if we can get our early adopters to have the data that they need to persuade their colleagues, that's really gonna have a big impact on increasing um, the use of OER. Um, likewise, we have administrators as an audience for some of our research on OER impact because we have people asking questions about like uh, student success metrics and course throughput rates, um, retention um, and completion. So these are things that administrators care about. Um, and I hear things like, you know, oh, it's very expensive for the college to support faculty in using OER. And if we can have some data that says, yeah, but you're going to get some of that money back in terms of higher tuition um, revenue, then, you know, maybe maybe that's persuasive and maybe that helps administrators understand um, how they can um, be supporting OER a little bit better. 
So uh, my last slide, I think, is just my contact information. Um, and with three minutes to go, if anybody has questions for me, um, I'd be happy to answer. Um, there is a question here first. Um, folks want links to the things that the um, resources that you mentioned, like your Canvas course. And I'm wondering if, if actually from all of the presenters, can we build a master list of all of your links today to send out via our listserv? Is that all right? That's fine with me. And let me know if you wind up adopting it because I'd like to um, hear your feedback. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm looking at the question that says, can we get a link to the OER Canvas course? And I would love feedback. Um, and I can also see in the chat that Quill is saying the analysis of money saved per dollar spent. Um, I've just been looking at my open textbook network data, um, which is where faculty do um, a review of an open textbook for $200 um, and then sort of following up like, okay, so did you adopt as a result um, of doing that review and what's your student enrollment and let's multiply that by that average $100 textbook price. Um, and so, you know, doing those reviews is a really effective way to um, spend program money because in my first go round, it was something like six student dollars saved per dollar spent. Um, now that a year has gone by and um, those instructor, those first instructors have been teaching more, others have implemented OER, we've run more workshops, and my initial analysis is that it's doubled and there's actually 12 student dollars saved per program dollars spent. Um, so um, it's, it's also, to me, the lesson is also about how when you're doing that kind of analysis, like having, having time pass is a very important factor in calculating savings. Um, we have another question. The OER Canvas course, your course, is it in Commons? Is that can people find it that way so that they can make copies? Yes. So I'm a new Canvas user, but I think that it's in Commons where you can, you know, publicly see it, make copies. It's CC by. If there's any problem with it, um, let me know how I can fix that because I'm new to Canvas. <laughs> and e-learning folks. Um, they want to make sure that we have an archived copy of this webinar and there will be an archived copy of this webinar. Um, it usually takes us about a week. It might take a little longer this time to get them out, but we do that. Um, and then, um, oh, what is the name to search in, in OER Commons? Um, Amy, do you have it listed as like um, Open Oregon? Is that the best way to find it? Um, I think it's called OER Redesign. Um, that's a good question from obviously a more experienced Canvas user. OER Course Redesign Training Master. Maybe I should rename that to have Open Oregon in the title. And it be able to unmute you. Una, are you around? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm here. I, Amy, are you able to type in the chat window? I'm not sure. Um, I'll try and you can tell me if you see it. Okay. Yes, we did. That's perfect. Uh, except you just sent it to the organizers. You'd want to send it to the entire audience if possible, which is the... Yeah, I don't think I have that option. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll retype for you. No problem. Thanks. <laughs> so this is Sarah, and I was trying to, because I I opened Canvas, because I wanted to see for Amy if I could open her course. It is set so that you can download the cartridge, but it's not set so you could import it directly in. But you can access the cartridge. So just so you know, it does work. OK, thank you so much. And I'll <laughs> no see if I can change those settings to make it more uh, copyable. 
<laughs> and again, everybody, we will um, post a list of resources because there were quite a few links that flew by and usually I'm on top of copying those, but when my computer is the one doing the presenting, I can't do that. So we will share the slides. We put, usually post the slides to slide share. Um, and we will also get a list of a master list of links from everybody for you. And we'll post that to the CCC OER listserv. So if you're not a member of the CCC OER list, now is a good time to join that. Um, joining that list service free, and it's a service that we offer. So visit our website to find out more about that. Um, I want to make sure that people know some things that are coming up because I know we're running over time. Um, so Open Ed 17. Um, is in Anaheim, California this year in October. And if you are interested in presenting at that conference, submissions are due this Friday. So it's a really simple um, proposal form, but I encourage folks to do it. It's a great conference. Um, and then we're gonna have, there's actually another webinar at this same time tomorrow about open education resources degrees. Um, and then, um, on April 12th, we're planning on having another webinar, one of our regular monthly webinars um, on OER degree research. And it will feature SRI International, which is a research firm that's working on the Achieving the Dream OER degree initiative. So um, they're doing some wonderful research work. So if you're interested in open education research and kind of the next evolution of the research on OER degrees, that'll be a great webinar. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back and look at questions one more time, but I know we're running low on time. Um, did we get a chance to answer everybody's questions? Oh, yes. Um, let's see. Una, do you have the registration link for tomorrow's webinar handy? Um, yes. Just one second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow uh, we're going to have, um, well, I want to, of course, I want to thank our, our wonderful presenters today from uh, West Hills College, um, Lansing Community College, and Amy from uh, the state of Oregon. Uh, tomorrow, we will have um, speakers from Montgomery College in Maryland. They'll be sharing their OER degree work uh, to date. They're about nine months in. And we'll also be having Austin Community College um, speaking on their work on the OER degree. And in their case, they're actually a consortium of eight colleges that are working on a degree together. So um, it's uh, going to be lots of great information. And I just got the link. Um, and let me, I'm sorry, I'm just typing that into the chat window for you as we speak. And there is the registration. So same time tomorrow, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, hope that uh, you can join us. Thank you, Quill and Una, and also thank you so much, uh, Vera and Regina. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you to you all. Thank you very much, and thank you for your for sharing such a wonderful project. It was fun to hear from all of you. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and I'll hang out and to answer more questions if they come up, but we'll go ahead and say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for your time, and hope happy Open Education Week. Bye. Bye.